Hello, uh, I'm Ben Whitaker. I'm Professor of uh, Chemical Physics at the University of Leeds in the Chemistry Department. And I was asked two questions, um, which I think we can join together. Uh, both carbon dioxide and water are considered to be greenhouse gases, but why should the former be considered more harmful when there's clearly more of the latter? And explain the link between the absorption of infrared radiation by bonds in carbon dioxide, methane and water, and global warming. Before we can answer these questions, we need to understand a bit of physics. Let's ask another question. What happens if we heat an object? Well, obviously, it gets hotter. But we also know from our everyday experience that things, for example, if we continuously heat something like a saucepan on a stove, things don't become infinitely hot. We always end up in an equilibrium situation in which the rate that we're pumping in heat into the object just balances the rate at which it's lost. Now, if the object in question is isolated in space, so that it isn't thermally connected to another cooler object, the only way that it can lose heat is by radiating that heat away. Objects like this are called black bodies for reasons that will become apparent. At the end of the 19th century, a number of people began to think about what the spectrum of the heat light from such an object would look like. Between about 1897 and 1899, Otto Lumer and Ernst Pringsheim, working together at the University of Breslau in Germany, made some very careful measurements of the light emitted by hot objects. In their experiments, they heated an iron cavity in a very carefully constructed furnace and made measurements of the light emitted through a small hole in the side of the, in the, side of the furnace. The temperature in the furnace was very stable for very long periods of time, and they measured the spectrum of the light that was emitted through this small hole in the cavity. A spectrum is simply the graph of the intensity of light as a function of wavelength. The spectrum of light coming out of such a cavity has a very characteristic shape that importantly only depends on the temperature of the furnace and not what the cavity is made of. This spectrum is called the black body spectrum. Black because most of the radiation is emitted at long wavelengths in the infrared, which the human eye can't see here running from one to six microns. An important feature to notice is that the peak wavelengths occur at shorter and shorter wavelengths as the temperature of the furnace increases. Notice also that there's a little chunk bitten out of the spectrum around three microns. This is due to residual water vapor between the hole in the cavity and the detector. Explaining the shape of the black body spectrum is uh, particularly the fact that it cuts off sharply in the blue in the short wavelength region was to prove a major problem for theoretical physics at the end of the 19th century. And its observation was one of the key pieces of evidence that led to the development of quantum theory and ultimately quantum mechanics about 30 years later. But that's a story for another time. To return to our original question, why is carbon dioxide considered to be a more harmful greenhouse gas than water? Well, the sun is a cloud of gas, mainly hydrogen, heated by the inside from, by a nuclear furnace. The sun is clearly isolated from its surroundings, so it must maintain thermal equilibrium by emitting as a black body. Only now, because it's so hot, it's not actually black. The spectrum from our sun, the yellow curve in the diagram, is very close to that of a black body at 5,250 degrees C. The sun is not exactly a black body because some of the radiation, some of the emitted light, is absorbed by atoms in its atmosphere, in its outer atmosphere. But it's pretty close. Because it's so hot, the peak of the black body spectrum now lies in the visible region of the spectrum rather than the infrared. But most of the light is still emitted in the infrared, which is why it feels warm on a summer's day. But notice that on the surface of the Earth, that's the red curve, the spectrum is quite different. A lot of the light in the infrared part of the black body spectrum is missing. Some of it's also missing from the ultraviolet region. And this is because light is being absorbed by molecules in the Earth's atmosphere. Most of the infrared light is being absorbed by water vapor and only a seemingly insignificant amount by carbon dioxide. So why is carbon dioxide considered to be a more harmful greenhouse gas than water? And 
While we're on the subject, why is none of the light absorbed by nitrogen when we know that there's much more nitrogen in the atmosphere than any other gas? Let's take a look at the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, about 21% is oxygen, and the remaining 1% or so is made up of the so-called trace gases. Actually, these numbers don't add up to 100% because the water vapor concentration depends on where you measure it. It's very close to zero at the poles and in the deserts, and about 4% or so, up to 4% or so, in the tropical regions of the, of the planet. So, not including water, which varies, after oxygen, the most significant trace gas in the atmosphere is actually nitrogen. And the so-called greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and so on, only, are only present in minute amounts, a little over 300 parts per million in the case of carbon dioxide and 20 parts per million in the case of methane. So once again, why is carbon dioxide considered to be a more harmful greenhouse gas than water? It doesn't look as if it ought to be important at all. But of course, we've forgotten something. The Earth itself is an isolated body that being, he being heated by the sun. The Earth must be a black body too. The Earth must be radiating energy to maintain thermal equilibrium. But because the Earth is not so hot as the sun, it radiates in the far infrared. The red line shows the black body spectrum of the sun, and the blue line shows the black body spectrum of an object at a temperature of about 288 Kelvin, 15 degrees Celsius, about the average surface temperature of the Earth. We notice that although water vapor absorbs in the long wavelength tail, here, at the peak of the emission, the spectrum has a local absorption minimum, or window. But we also notice that the long wavelength edge of this window is precisely where carbon dioxide absorbs. This is why carbon dioxide is such an important greenhouse gas. The greenhouse effect is due to the thermal, the black body radiation emitted by the Earth being absorbed by the atmosphere and therefore heating it up. There are a number of interesting and important features to notice in this figure. If the Earth's atmosphere was entirely made up of nitrogen and oxygen, it's been estimated that the average surface temperature of the Earth would be a rather inhospitable minus 18 degrees Celsius, 255 Kelvin. At 255 Kelvin, the black body emission spectrum of the Earth would shift to the right just a little bit. And that's just where water, water absorbs. So the greenhouse effect due to water vapor is what's responsible for keeping the Earth at a comfortable temperature. Unlike, say, the surface, uh, surface of Mars, which these days has, a, has practically no water vapor left in its atmosphere uh, and is extremely cold. The greenhouse effect due to water vapor causes the Earth to heat up so that its emission spectrum falls roughly into the region where the water, where the, where the atmosphere is transparent and allows most of the heat to escape. The greenhouse effect then is not altogether a bad thing. But notice that carbon dioxide and also ozone, methane, nitrous dioxide, all have absorption features lying in this window in the water vapor spectrum. So although they're present only in relatively small amounts, these molecules have a very strong influence on the atmospheric temperature. The reason why this is a potential cause for concern is that all these gases have significant man-made anthropogenic sources. Carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels, methane from agriculture, leaking gas pipes, ozone from the oxidation of volatile organic compounds such as solvents and paints in the atmosphere, and nitrous oxide is another combustion byproduct. Now you may be wondering why nitrogen and oxygen, which we know are far more abundant in the atmosphere than any of the other gases we've been talking about, do not absorb infrared radiation, and, and why is water such a strong infrared absorber? Unfortunately, that would be another 
long story that would require some understanding of quantum mechanics. Briefly, in order for a molecule to absorb light, the charge distribution in the molecule needs to change. That's because light's an oscillating electric field, and in order for it to interact with matter, it has to interact with the charge. Oxygen and nitrogen can absorb light, but only by rearranging the electrons in different molecular orbitals, and that takes a lot of energy. So oxygen and nitrogen only absorb significantly in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum, below about 0.2 microns. There's actually a small and narrow absorption from oxygen molecules in the near infrared. It's this band here. This is a very weak electronic transition due to the fact that oxygen has a lowest lying electronic state in which two of its valence electrons are unpaired. This is very unusual. And the fact that we can see this transition at all in the solar spectrum is due to the fact that there's an awful lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. In general, homonuclear diatomic molecules like oxygen and nitrogen cannot absorb infrared radiation because the charge distribution doesn't change as the molecule vibrates. Incidentally, since argon is an atom and therefore can't vibrate, it can't absorb infrared radiation either. By contrast, water, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide all have ways of bending or stretching that cause the charge distribution in the molecule to change. These vibrations have frequencies that correspond to infrared wavelengths. As a result, these molecules all have strong infrared vibrations, uh, infrared absorptions. And the reason why water and to some extent carbon dioxide show uh, such a long series of absorptions at higher and higher frequencies is because of a phenomenon known as overtone bands. Essentially, a molecular vibration is analogous to a plucked string on a musical instrument, like a guitar or a violin. And in addition to the so-called fundamental frequency of vibration to which the string is tuned, it can also vibrate at harmonics at twice, three times, and so on of the fundamental frequency. Here's the fundamental frequency here, first harmonic, second harmonic, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. Because the OH vibration in water is tuned to a higher frequency than in carbon dioxide, and because it's present in the atmosphere at much higher concentrations, it exhibits a stronger harmonic spectrum than carbon dioxide. So its influence can be seen right the way through the infrared spectrum of the atmosphere. I thought I might finish this talk where I began with another observation about the black body spectrum. I said at the beginning of the talk that the peak wavelength of the black body spectrum is just a function of temperature. But another observation is that the total intensity of the light, that is the area under the curve, also increases with temperature. In fact, it goes like the temperature to the fourth power. This is called the Stefan Boltzmann law. It has an interesting consequence that was once pointed out in an article that appeared in the April edition of the prestigious journal Applied Optics in 1972. In the book of Isaiah, there's a description of heaven, which says that in heaven, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days. Now, on a winter's day in Leeds, that may indeed seem like paradise, but you need to be careful of what you wish for. Because we can use the Stefan Boltzmann law now to calculate from this description of heaven what the temperature of heaven must be. The heaven, heaven receives as much light from the moon as we do from the sun, and then another 49 times as much as the earth done, does from the sun. So heaven receives 50 times the radiation that the earth receives from the sun, neglecting the uh, light that we receive from the moon. And we can now calculate from the Stefan Boltzmann law, uh, what the ratio of the temperature of heaven to the temperature of the Earth must be. So we have from the Stefan Boltzmann law that the ratio of the temperature of heaven to the temperature of Earth raised to the fourth power is 50. 
taking the temperature of the Earth to be 300 Kelvin, that gives the temperature of heaven as 798 Kelvin. The paper goes on to ask whether we can use biblical evidence to calculate the temperature of hell. Um, the exact temperature can't be computed, but in Revelations, there's a, a statement about hell that the fearful and unbelieving shall have, as their, have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Lake of molten brimstone means that it's a lake of molten sulfur, which has a boiling point at about 440 degrees C. So we have then that heaven is hotter than hell. Well, that's the end of the story. <laughs>